Hi, my name is Tara Moore, and I'm the Director of Conservation Partnerships for the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. And we are so excited to have you all here for the first of the Marine Fisheries webinar series. This will be a Southern Flounder discussion, so I'm sure it's going to be a very interesting one. Um, we have some great speakers here today who we will introduce in just a moment. Um, this series, so this is the first of the series, and every Thursday for the next three weeks, we will have another topic. So next Thursday, we will have a shrimp trawling webinar on at, at 12 p.m. again, and the Thursday after, there will be a tragedy of the commons talk. Um, so we're excited to bring these great discussions to you. I'm just, um, I'm going to turn it over to Chuck King, who is the president of the Gaston Paws chapter, and he will be interviewing our speakers today. Um, so thank you so much for being here, Chuck. Of course, um, thanks for asking me. I do appreciate it. And I appreciate everyone showing up today for the presentation. We've got uh, two, two speakers, um, Mr. Lewis Daniels and Mr. Rocky Carter. Uh, we're gonna get started with Lewis is gonna do uh, a quick presentation of the status of the Southern Flounder in the state. And for those of you that don't know Lewis, he has a PhD in fisheries oceanography and uh, was the chief marine scientist for the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. And he's working on uh, the sound solutions program for us. And then Rocky has been a strong champion of conservation for our marine fisheries over several years. He served in many volunteer positions with various conservation organizations, and he currently serves on the state board for the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. So I, I do appreciate both of you coming today and doing this presentation. And uh, Lewis, I'll turn it over to you to get started. Thanks, Chuck, and welcome everybody. It's good to see um, a lot of familiar, familiar faces. I'm going to try to see if I can do this sheer screen thing without causing a terrible problem. All right, Tara, can you see it? We can see it. You oh. All right, Tara, can you see it? We can see it. You Dog, new tricks. So the intent and purpose behind this, um, this my presentation is just to go over the history of, the, of Southern Flounder Management um, since the original fishery management plan that was adopted in 2005. We started working on that plan in 2003-2004 and at the time commercial landings were around three and a half million pounds um, and recreational landings contributed around 13 percent um, of the landings and at the time the stock was overfished with overfishing in current and the goal of the original plan was to rebuild the spawning stock biomass to the target in 10 years. Um, the stock assessment at the time indicated a 30% reduction in harvest would rebuild the stock, spawning stock to the threshold in five years. Um, with the idea that by redoing the stock, the, the plan every five years, we would then develop the plan to get us to the target in the 10 years. Um, a 14 inch size limit and an eight fish recreational bag limit coupled with a 14 inch size limit and a November, I believe it was the third um, commercial closure was proposed to meet the needed reductions at the time. Um, the Marine Fisheries Commission approved the recommended harvest reductions for the recreational fishery um, with a 14 inch size limit and eight fish bag. The commission did not approve the recommended harvest reduction for the commercial fishery. Um, while a 14 inch size limit was required, the season closure was changed um, from early November until December 1. Um, economics was the stated justification for not requiring the necessary harvest um, in the commercial fishery at the meeting in Ocracoke at that time. The, the commission also indicated that they would just um, quote, hope the DMF science was wrong. Um, so uh, several years later, we began developing Amendment 1. Um, it was developed over a four year period from 09 to 12. Um, the 2009 updated stock assessment did show some improvements um, in the stock. We did see some improved age structure um, and some other indicators were showing some positive signs, but we were still overfished and overfishing was occurring. 
Um, efforts to get the problem under control were delayed until the amendment was adopted in 2013. So unfortunately, that was already eight years after the original FMP was adopted. The amendment increased the recreational size limit to 15 inches and decreased their bag limit to six. Um, the action was projected to meet a 20, I think it was a 20.2% reduction, but for simplicity, 20%. The commercial harvest reductions actually came in the form of the pre existing gillnet restrictions that were implemented to reduce interactions with threatened and endangered sea turtles in the large mesh gillnet fishery. The thought was that reductions in the significant reductions in the amount of gear and the times that they were allowed to fish, the large mesh gillnets were allowed to fish, coupled with area closures that would occur once some of the turtle takes had been reached, would satisfy the needed commercial harvest reductions to end overfishing and rebuild um, the spawning stock biomass. Um, a new stock assessment was conducted in 2014, um, but could not be used for management. Um, there was a lot of angst about that. But the problem was new information that had indicated that southern flounder were actually from North Carolina to Florida and a single stock. And so as a result, the, a coastwide stock assessment was necessary to accurately portray the condition of the resource. Um, regardless, the stock assessment indicated an even worse condition for the resource. Um, the commission voted to recommend uh, the, to the secretary of the department at the time to develop a supplement to Amendment 1 to reduce flounder catches up to 60% based on the continued decline in the fishery. So summary so far, the 2014 stock assessment was not usable for management purposes, but indicated the stock continued to decline based on all metrics. The recreational measures have consistently followed the DMF recommendation and presumably achieved the necessary reductions. The original commercial closure of December 1 achieved only a fraction of the required commercial reduction needed to reach the goal of the plan. And clearly, um, in retrospect, the assumption that gillnet regulations implemented to protect sea turtles, they did not appear to have the desired effect of reducing the gillnet harvest and did not address, and that did not address pound nets at all. And I believe that we're, I, I, I stand to be corrected here, but I believe we're still issuing pound net permits or were up until just recently. Um, the stock assessment in 2014 essentially indicated no progress in rebuilding the fishery over the past nine years. Um, one year shy of the year we were supposed to be recovered um, to sustainable harvest based on statutes. Um, the supplement contains some significant harvest reductions necessary to provide meaningful reductions in the fishery. Um, closed seasons and gear specific quotas was finally a step in the right direction here. Um, a stock assessment involving the states from North Carolina to Florida began in early 16. And prior to implementing the supplement in 2016, however, the North Carolina Fisheries Association filed a suit and a judge issued a temporary injunction on any new regulations on October the 10th, 2016. This really prevented any new regulations until a new amendment was developed. Um, there were some issues in the in from the from the injunction that were allowed to to go through, but the most substantive reductions that would have resulted in reduced harvest uh, were, were, were set aside until a new amendment could be developed. And so with that, the, with the new assessment, the new assessment with data through 2017, which uh, included the states of North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, showed the stock again was in even worse shape than we had thought. And now the reduction required is a 72% reduction in order to achieve the rebuilding goal or target in 10 years. Um, keep in mind the first 10 years was up in 2016 and the stock was still overfished and most importantly overfishing was still occurring. Um, there's no repercussions um, for not meeting the timeline. So unfortunately, the Fisheries Reform Act is silent. It says you shall um, rebuild in 10 years, but it doesn't say what happens if you don't. Um, Amendment 2 was developed in the 1819 timeframe to phase in an end to overfishing and rebuild the stock by 2028. Um, the DMF recommended a 62% reduction in 2019 and a 72% reduction in 2020. Um, the DMF projected a season for the commercial fishery that would reduce harvest by 62% in 2019 and 72% in 2020. 
Um, why the DMF and the commission chose a 62% reduction, which was contrary to the to the science and stock assessment that said we needed 72% to reach the target by 2028 um, is unknown. Further, why the state chose to phase in and end to overfishing when it had failed in the previous 15 years to end overfishing is also unknown. Amendment 2 maintained the 15 inch size limit that actually results in a harvest of primarily immature females and failed to monitor the quota on the commercial fishery while open, opening it during peak season with no harvest limits. The results of Amendment 2 was the harvest reduction in 2000, 2019 was only 34 percent. The harvest reduction in 2020 is still unknown, but is far less than 72 percent based on preliminary information. The failure of Amendment 2 was projected and expressed by the Wally Federation and others um, to no avail. As a result, after 15 years, an original plan with two amendments and a supplement to manage this fishery Southern fly will remain overfished and a far cry from rebuilt. It is also likely that overfishing is still occurring. The management actions were totally ineffective to achieve the required reductions in 2019 and 2020. One of the problems is that the total removals to the stock are not being calculated correctly, failing to account for Southern flounder bycatch in multiple fisheries or the unreported harvest by commercial fishermen who do not sell their catch. As a result of this, the status of the stock is likely worse than the dire conditions of trade in the current stock. Assessment. The DMF and the Commission are now developing Amendment 3. The stock assessment only assessed fish through 2017. Since that time, the 72% reduction required to rebuild the stock has not been achieved. Because the required reductions were not met, new reductions must be calculated to account for the failure in 2018, 19, and 20. The percent reduction now needed is likely closer to 90 percent. The scientist on the Marine Fisheries Commission brought this issue to the attention of the Commission and Division in February of 2021, asking for the reduction requirements to be adjusted by staff. The scientist was quickly admonished for bringing up the issue without proper notice. The issue remains unaddressed and unresolved. The draft Amendment 3 is yet to be approved for management in 2021. The season generally opens in September or October. Two meetings have been held to discuss allocation between commercial and recreational sectors with no discussion on specific options to reduce harvest better than the proposals in Amendment 2. We are concerned that the Commission will be forced into managing Southern Flounder under status quo for 2021, causing further detriment to the stock under regulations that have proven a failure. Review of the current Amendment 3 document provides little hope that any measures will be implemented that will result in necessary reductions. The likelihood that a new plan will be approved in time for the 2021 season appears highly doubtful. The likelihood that a new plan will contain the necessary actions to achieve the rebuilding goals set forth in statute are even less likely. In fact, the most promising management actions that were proposed, size limit changes and hard quotas, was rejected by the DMF for consideration based on a quick review of Amendment 3 that no longer appears to be available. I'm, I'm trying to get a new copy of Amendment 3, but I'm, I'm not sure that's available for public review yet. It was available for the commission meeting, but they didn't discuss it and they canceled the meeting um, to discuss uh, the allocation. The primary concern by the management authorities appears to be the social and economic consequences of management rather than the mission of the division to protect and enhance the resource. So we've made an effort to bring this to the attention of the division. We've sent multiple letters. We've had actual had face to face conversations um, with them and provided this feedback, but we haven't really received much response. Um, so the only options that we feel we have at this point to make our concerns known to people who can make a change and, and what we believe is critical is that you write your specific elected officials, both House and Senate members. Um, expressing your concern over the management of our coastal marine resources, um, right to Governor Cooper, expressing the same concerns and need, and and then certainly submit comments when it's a, when it's opportune to the on the upcoming Amendment Three um, to the DEQ Secretary, the the DMF Director, whoever that is at the time, and Chair of the Marine Fisheries Commission, demanding re meaningful reductions. Um, to get us back on track for a 2028 recovery of this important fishery. 
That is all I have, Chuck and Tara. Lewis, I appreciate it. Uh, fairly comprehensive presentation. Uh, I guess one of the one of the benefits of being the, the moderator, I get to ask a couple questions first. And one thing that you mentioned that kind of piques my interest is uh, why are the options for the size limits and uh, the hard quotas removed by the DMF? Um, because to me, as someone familiar with like red drum recovery, for example, it was something that seemed to have previously worked. So could care to elaborate or do you have any insight? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we, we've been talking about this now for a couple of years, um, you know, and, and one of the things that's occurred is the, the biology of flounder. Um, we've become more familiar with what the, the true science is. New research has shown that these fish don't become fully mature until they're 22 inches long. Um, they're 75% mature at 18 inches and, and only 50% mature at, at, at 15 inches. And as a result, um, you know, five, five, or 50 inches, um, primarily harvest juvenile female that have never spawned. That's first. Um, an interesting factor is that males don't really reach much over 15 inches, if 15 inches at all. And so what we've proposed was a slot limit similar to drum. If you mentioned drum, it's similar to drum that would allow a fishery to operate from 12 to 18 inches and protect the adult female spawners, which is at a critical low level right now. And so if we were able to do that, then that would that would provide multiple benefits to both commercial and recreational fisheries, in my opinion. All right, because what it would allow is it would allow for that small flounder market to reestablish in the commercial fishery. That was traditionally that was a very important market, the, the plate sized flounder, single baby flounder fishery. It would also allow for a percentage of the quota, 30 to 40 percent is the estimate that I've read of female fit of male fish. So if you had a quota of 500,000 pounds, you would expect about 200,000 of that, maybe almost half of that would be caught by unfished males because they're not big enough to be caught at 15 inches. Um, so we, we feel that it, the other, oh, the other issue, the critical issue is that right now it takes recreational fishermen based on the Marine Recreational Information Program, about 10 to 15 fish to catch a 15 inch fish. So there's a tremendous amount of discards in the recreational fishery. There's about a 10% discard mortality. So what they, if you were to go to a 12 to 18 inch fish, the number of discards, the, the likelihood of catching a legal flounder would go up dramatically and with, by, thereby reducing the number of discards um, in the recreational fishery. And so that could help to maybe extend that season, which right now is like six weeks long, um, extend that season or perhaps even modify the, the, the bag limit a little bit if you were to eliminate that bycatch. <clears throat> For I, I, I've, we've tried, we've made multiple efforts to discuss the, the, that issue. Um, it really has, we've not been able to get any kind of response back other than maybe the impacts to gear, or I'm not exactly sure why we would want to continue to harvest juvenile fish in a stock that's in such dire condition as Southern Flounder, but I can't explain why that's been at least it appeared in the Amendment 3 document that that has been, any change to the size limit has been eliminated for further consideration. I didn't know the division could do that. If the commission wanted to, to, to select the size limit change, you know, historically they could. Something must have changed that that's not allowed anymore. I, I can't explain that. The quota makes no sense to me. I mean, we were supposed to land the commercial fishery was supposed to harvest, I think it was 592,000 pounds in 2019. The landings were 799,000 pounds, but that was just the landings. All right, so that did not account for bycatch in the crab trawl fishery, bycatch in the shrimp trawl fishery. It didn't account for any fish that are unreported by commercial fishermen that use, that, that use their commercial licenses but don't sell their catch. It also doesn't account for any of those many, multiple people that buy a commercial license so they can not abide by the gigging bag limits for the recreational fishery. None of those fish are reported. None of those fish are counted towards the 799,000 pounds. So the actual landings 
is are probably closer to a million or more pounds as opposed to 799,000 pounds. So we've at least doubled the commercial allocation. And we know that the recreational fishery just went crazy during the six week season and their landings were above what they were supposed to land. So we're not achieving the reductions on either side. And yet we don't want to have a hard quota that would that would require the division. I mean, my my experience says that the trip ticket program is intended to monitor quotas. And we do that. We've done that for multiple species. Why that's all of a sudden impossible to do for Southern Flounder, I can't explain it. We were planning to do that with the supplement that was that was stopped. But why we don't have the only way we're going to make we're only way we're going to rebuild this fishery, in my opinion, is with hard quotas, with payback for both sectors, and changing the size limit to prevent to stop harvesting all these juvenile fish or harvest juvenile fish and protect the adults like we do with red drum, which is one of our very few success stories, by the way. I hope that answers your question. It, it does, but so so if the, the, the data supports changes in the size limits and in the quotas, is that the appropriate technical data being used by the commission and the DMF to, to evaluate the current situation that we have then? Well, I, that's hard for me to say because I'm not in the building anymore, um, and 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 it's very hard to get in the building anymore. Um, so what they're using, I don't know what the justification is for maintaining a 15 inch size limit from a biological standpoint. It has to be something. It has to be something social or economic, I think. But from my discussions with many commercial fishermen, the 12 to 18 inch slot has been has been supported by many of them. Now, I'm not going to say all of them do because nobody agrees on everything. But my understanding is, is that they recognize the benefits of that and, and, and know that they're not that many fish over 16 to 18 inches anyway. And so and protecting those big adult female spawners is critically important. I, I, I can't I can't explain why the why that is not even being considered by the commission. I, I can't explain that. Um, they may elect to do something different. That's their prerogative, but it's not, I, from my understanding, it's not even being considered. But the fact that we have these allowable harvest rates, these total removals, which is what the stock assessment says, is that the amount of fish that can be harvested is, is total removals. That's not just landings. All right, in the recreational fishery, it's the, it's the landings estimate plus the bycatch from the, from, from, from the 10% of the bycatch. From the commercial fishery, it appears that it's just the landings with no consideration for any of the bycatch or unreported catches. I don't personally feel that's using the best available data to estimate the harvests and maintain the catches below the level needed to rebuild the stock. So there's no way, there's no possible way with only a 34% reduction in 19 and probably somewhere around maybe a 50% reduction in 2020. There's no way that even if we achieve 72% from now to 2028 that we will rebuild because we've got to readjust those numbers in order to get back on track. If our if our if our if our IRA drops to 2%, we need 10% to get to our retirement goal. We got to hope that the interest rates go up or we're screwed. And that's kind of the situation here. And so I don't know how we're going to, I don't know how they're going to do it with the existing, with what I've seen in Amendment 3. And again, I'd like to have another copy of it. Um, but I'm very concerned that what was taught, what was said at the last meeting was that staff's got to go back and figure out how they're going to deal with this allocation thing two years later when it goes to 60 40. What we really need to be doing is figuring out how in the world we're going to achieve these reductions that we need in 2021. And if we got to come back and do another amendment, but this amendment is supposed to get us to 2028. I don't see how it can be done successfully. Yeah, and understood. And I appreciate the, the explanation for that. And Rocky, if you don't mind, would you care to elaborate on some of the things that 
the Wildlife Federation have done or proposed or that are in, dis in discussions to help with the issue? I think you might be on mute, Rocky. Sorry about that. I believe that the uh, one mission, one commission uh, uh, will give us the opportunity to put our management of our fisheries uh, under a transparent leadership group that will help us uh, have a better control and a better understanding of what's happening in our fisheries and uh, uh, a more responsive um, management policies to ensure the longevity and the sustainability of not only southern flounder but all fisheries. Uh, one of my concerns over the flounder issues that we did not mention was not only was southern flounder uh, fishing closed to our recreational fishermen, but all flounder fishing, including the uh, summer flounder and the Gulf flounder, uh, under the uh, understanding that we could not tell the difference between each species. So that uh, further uh, puts us down the road with uh, not trusting what the uh, commission uh, or the DMF uh, can do with will do with this uh, fishery. One Mission, One Commission is a great opportunity for us to unite, have a united voice for our fisheries. And, and when you say One Mission, One Commission, uh, what, what do you mean by that? Uh, the Wildlife Resource Commission uh, would be in charge of our coastal fisheries. We'd have one commission. OK. And I guess and, and we know long term effects if we don't do if we don't do anything, uh, we right. know what it's going to look like in 10, 20 years, 30 years from now. But let's just for 2021, if, if, if nothing happens in. Prior to the season opening up, what and this question is for either one of you, what do you foresee the results being this fall since we, we know that landings and people going out when that season opened up really ramped up and folks hit the water hard. Well, this is Lewis. I think that, you know, the, the what I was told was that it was likely because of the delays that we would have status quo for 2021. That that concerns me. What that means is, is that the and I think the division has already um, submitted the proclamation for the recreational season to open. I believe it's uh, August 15th through September with a four fish bag limit and a 15 inch size limit. Um, the commercial season was reduced from 2019 and 2020. I believe they shaved a week, maybe two weeks off of the commercial season um, to to operate in 2020. So if there's no plan in place. I think the, 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 the conventional wisdom is, is that the fishery would operate the same way in 21. Um, I think that folks could argue that, though, that if that if without if the, the amendment to address 20, 19 and 20, it doesn't say anything about 21. So I think there's a possibility that they could say, you know, there are no restrictions. Um, I don't I hope that doesn't happen, but I think that's a possibility. And I think there are some folks that would push for that. Um, but I think if you have another season like you had in 2020, which was a, I don't remember what the length of the season was, it's a very short season for the commercial fishery. Um, you know, they said that the landings this year were depressed because of COVID. So if we if we still didn't meet the reductions in 2020 with even shorter season to meet the 72 percent reduction, if we've eliminated the COVID concerns that seem to have been real to the commercial industry and the recreational industry, then the likelihood is, is that there would be more opportunity in 2021 to harvest even more fish. And that way the reductions would be even less and we'd be even further behind in achieving the 2028 goal for recovery. Understood, thanks for that. Um, really, that's that's the extent of of my questions. If Rocky, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, I would encourage everyone to write your legislators 
uh, tell them the importance of uh, uh, being very proactive with our management and fisheries. I'd write the uh, governor, encourage everyone to write our governor, uh, that this is something that we need to take action on. It's, it's important to us today, and it will be important to those following behind us. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, now we can uh, open it up to participants questions. Uh, if you have a question to ask and you, you can't type it up in the chat, then please raise your hand and as I call on you, feel free to ask away. I think I see a question in there from Ed, yeah. Ed Walsh. Ed Walsh, yeah. Perfect. Yes. Uh, at what point does this fishery become unrecoverable? At the current, at the current depletion rates. Well, that's that's. This is Lewis. I, th I think that would be a, that would be a difficult question to answer. I, I think you know what we know about marine fisheries is that the likelihood of extinction is remote the likelihood of that happening is very very rare these are these are our strategist fishes that spawn a lot of eggs and the chances of eliminating them are, i think are virtually zero the chances of them becoming economically extinct i think is pretty good i mean i think they kind of are i mean we've got some commercial fishermen on the webinar i mean Back in 95, when the Fisheries Reform Act started, we were landing 5 million pounds of southern flounder a year. Now we're allowed to, now they're allowed to land, well, ideally they'd be allowed to land around 400,000 pounds. I mean, that's spread out over a lot of folks that used to depend on southern flounder for their livelihood. And that's, it's got to be hurting a lot of people to have those restrictions be that severe. Um, you know, at what point do people say, I can't afford to set my pound nets any longer? I mean, a great gear, one that's always been supported is one that has a little bycatch and can release the fish. Um, you know, they're very expensive to set that gear. So, I mean, at what point will the fishermen say, I just can't afford to set them anymore? Um, I think that's approaching. I think if we continue on the path we're on right now, it's gonna be here quicker than we realize. Um, there are others I'm sure that disagree, but I, it, it sort of looks to me like if, if you had, if you had managed this fishery as a quota in 19 and 20, um, with payback for going over the quota, the allowable harvest in 2021 for the commercial fishery would be 14,000 pounds, not accounting for any bycatch or discards or unreported catches. So that's pretty much ex economic extinction for the commercial fishery. I think the recreational fishery has, you know, they're going after them as hard as they can during those six weeks. I mean, you see it. I mean, there are boats everywhere. People are talking about it, you know, season opens and people are going just as hard as they can go. And, and I'm sure there are people going out and catching a group and going back and catching another. I mean, the enforcement's probably very difficult on the recreational side. So I think, I mean, I think we're, we're in a scrape on both sides, but at what point does the, does the recreational fishery just finally say, you know, it's not worth it for one fish. It's not worth it for two fish. Um, you know, I personally believe that the only way to manage this fishery right now is as a bycatch fishery for both sides, one fish bag limit and some kind of limit on the commercial fishery that allows them to main, you know, hold fish. At least that way they'd be able to have fish in April, May, June, when the fish are worth three, four times what they're worth in the fall when they're competing with the trawl caught flounders and all the other flounders. You know, I, 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 that's what we have suggested as the Wildlife Federation is one option um, is to consider a bycatch fishery. Um, so it's a tough question. I mean, we've seen some stocks that are at pretty low levels like river herring and lang sturgeon and short nose sturgeon, you know, at the stage of endangered or threatened or concerned. Um, but I, th I think the nice thing about flounder is they could come back quick. You know, they, 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 they mature relatively early and they don't live very long. And I think if we, if we took hard strips here for the next, for a few years, we'd see dramatic increases that would have huge benefits to both the commercial and the recreational sector and the resource. 
but that doesn't I, whether that's in the cards in the upcoming amendment we'll have to wait and see thank you all right our next question i believe i saw uh, mr glenn skinner skinner stick his, his hand up did you have a question you're on mute glenn all right, sorry about that. Uh, I tried to raise my hand. It, it said it wasn't raising. Uh, so uh, I, I, um, just so most of you know, I'm the executive director of North Carolina Fisheries Association, uh, also a commercial fisherman. Uh, you might be surprised to know that a lot of stuff Lewis said uh, we actually agree with. We've been pushing for a slot limit for some time. Uh, and, and I can't explain why the division uh, says we can't implement a slot limit uh, if y'all would like me to. but. Uh, I also believe there's some misinformation in Lewis's presentation, a lot of information left out. Uh, and I certainly don't want to start any conflict here, so I, I'm not going to address that too much. But there is a subject that uh, Dr. Daniels and I had talked about quite a bit when he was director. Uh, you know, we haven't achieved a recreational reduction in harvest or dead discards, total removals altogether throughout our management process. Uh, uh, at when Dr. Daniels was director, he had told me that the recreational sector was recouping the fish that were lost through the commercial sector due to the reductions that were passed. And uh, I'd wonder if Dr. Daniels would elaborate on that and also uh, inform us on how that impacts our ability to rebuild this stock if we only achieve a reduction on one sector and then a portion of those fish are recouped by the other sector. Thanks, Glenn, and it's good to see you. And and any um, you know, any any time we could get together and talk about this and talk about some of the disparities in in my thinking here and yours, I, I'd appreciate that opportunity. And certainly, if we could, if you could use your influence to bring a DMF person there, that would be really good. Um, I recall those conversations that we had, and and you're right. I, I think that if you look back at the slide that I presented that said at the time of the original plan, I think the recreational landings were about 13%. Um, we know the stock had been overfishing for a long time at that point. Um, and I and and I want to say, and, and we, we might, I don't want to get into a conflict either, but I, I would say that the reason the recreational fishery was so depressed was because I think it was because of the expanded commercial fishery, and I don't think there was many fish available in the original at the beginning of the original plan than there were. There's no doubt that when you achieve the reductions in the commercial fishery, it makes more fish available for the recreational fishery. There's no, I don't think there's any doubt about that. So if you see a commercial reduction of say 30%, or if you see that the large mesh gill nets have been closed for sometimes months in the Pamlico Sound due to turtle interactions, that lost catch by the commercial fishery actually makes more flounder available for harvest by the recreational sector. There, there's no doubt about that. Um, and so that is recoupment. That, that's a term, a fisheries term. It might be a term, it's probably a term for a lot of things where you know they, they make up for that that reduction by so it is very difficult to monitor and manage the recreational fishery, just like it's very difficult to monitor and manage the commercial fishery, at least in terms of bycatch and discards and all of that. I mean, we know that there's a tremendous amount of discard. Where I believe, at least this is my opinion, all of this is my opinion, I believe that the discards in the large red drum fishery in Pamlico Sound by the recreational fishery is a, is a big issue. I, I think it's come up compromising the rebuilding of the red drum fishery as a result of loss of a lot of these 20, 30, 40, 50 year old fish in Pamlico Sound as a result of a directed recreational fishery. There's no doubt in my mind about that. Um, so, so Glenn is right. I mean, if you're, you're looking at kind of a reallocation when you look at this, that's why it's so important and why the recreational fishery needs to understand that that's why these bag limit reductions are so necessary and why, you know, for fish, probably results in people going out after them. You know, no limit on the commercial fishery, even though it's a short period of time, is no incentive for people not to go. And so we know, and Glenn can probably remember this very well, when we implemented the attendance requirement on small mass gillnets in the red drum fishery management plan, 
it was not just to it was not just to reduce bycatch of red drum in smallmouth gillnets. It was meant to dissuade people from going fishing with large with small mesh gill nets and leaving this gear. All right. And so that was a de facto reduction in effort at the time. Only the serious bona fide commercial fishermen went out and actually did that. The folks that like to go set their gear and go home and take a nap or go home and go to bed and come back the next day or whatever, they said it wasn't worth it. The bona fide commercial fishermen kept fishing. So you're absolutely right. You, you can't manage this thing commercial only, recreational only. You will not be successful. And with the increasing number of recreational fishermen, the increasing recreational interests, the internets and the places where people, everybody wants to talk about where they caught their fish and that's where everybody goes. The opportunity for recreational harvest to exceed its limits are equally concerning as the commercial side. I hope that addresses your question, Glenn, and clarifies our discussion and I hope it's consistent with what we talked about however many years ago. Thank you, Lewis, and thank you for the question, Glenn. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Bill G has his hand raised. Do you have a question? Yeah, this is Bill Gordon, the owner of Boat Up Lures, and for full disclosure, I'm the um, legislative proxy on the Atlantic states. My, my questions slash comments for, for Dr. Daniels. Um, I've been really hitting my head against the wall with this fishery. Um, and my knowledge of it, involvement of trying to understand it is uh, nowhere near that of Dr. Daniels. But uh, I learned quick and, and try to catch up quick. Um, and, and one of my concerns with going to a one fish is that ultimately you have one harvested fish for one dead discarded fish. And what we continue to see in the recreational sector is this massive dead discards. Um, <coughs> and I've continued to ask and ask and ask and ask, well, under a TAC management system, going to a smaller size limit actually gets you more poundage. You know, if, if everything's based on poundage and a 17 inch fish is 2.2 .2 pounds and a 12 inch fish is one pound. Um, but then I keep being told, you know, the statute that requires the two and 10 year rebuilding. Um, do you think that's something that we need to look at? You know, if we have a statute that's forcing us to take management actions that's counterproductive to rebuilding the stock, um, I can only imagine that we could all agree, you know, that that needs to be quickly addressed and changed without changing, you know, the whole RFA. Um, and then my last question is, is there any more data that proves that this is a you know, the, the unit stock is from Florida to North Carolina, or is there just evidence of, you know, mixed migrating? Thank you. Thank you, Billy. It's good to, it's good to hear you. I can't see you, but I can hear you. Um, <laughs> always appreciate your comments. Um, and, and I agree. I mean, I think the, the difficulties, again, as, as Glenn and I were talking about, the difficulties in in managing the recreational fishery are 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 real, and 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 there is a lot of folks that uh, you know are are going to go out and fish for them whether they want to or not, whether they whether they feel like they should or not. Um, the the your point about the ten years and two years is one that has eaten at me since I wrote that language twenty years ago. Um, some people came to me and they wanted to see legislation to require two years to end over fishing and 10 years to rebuild unless the stat, unless the fish was basically, unless it was a red drum that lives to be 60 years old and there's no way to rebuild a, 10, a 60 year old fish in 10 years. And the vast majority of the fish that we manage are less, live to be about 10 years and you should be able to rebuild them in 10 years. Um, but we started getting towards the we started getting towards crunch time when I was director on flounder. It was the first plan where it was like, oh gosh, guys, we're we're getting we're going into 
eight years, eighth year of a 10 year rebuilding time and we haven't ended over fishing yet. What are we gonna do in 10 years when it says we shall rebuild in 10 years? What happens if we don't? And nobody was ever able to answer that question. And I was very concerned as the director of marine fisheries that it was my responsibility that if I didn't rebuild this stock within 10 years, it was the responsibility of the division director who failed to achieve the necessary measures. And I was assured that I didn't have to worry about that, thank God. But that's been a problem ever since 2006, ever since, ever since the, the second, the amendment one to the flounder plan, right? Was what are we gonna do? How are we, we just gotta do our best, you know? And the time just continued to go by and to continue to go by. So now we've added, we've just, all we did, I mean, the facts are we added another 10 years, just added 10 more years, which means we take the minimum action to rebuild in 10 years. We're, we didn't say we have to rebuild in five now, which would have been more reasonable. We didn't say that there had to be a 50% reduction or a moratorium, God forbid. All right, but there's nothing in the statute that says what you do if you fail to meet the two years to end over fishing and the 10 years to rebuild. And that needs that's a, that, that's something that I think many of us have tried to to persuade legislators that that needs to be fixed. And I, I was doing it back in 2014 and I was unsuccessful. Um, and my predecessors, I guess, have been unsuccessful as well in getting that statutory language uh, corrected. So at least we know, you know, commercial recreational, the public knows that if that you better be serious about this or why even have the 10 year deadline in there. Um, you know, as far as as far as the stock distribution, we knew based on some tagging work, a lot of tagging work that was done in, in South Carolina back in the 80s and early 90s, that there was some mixing of flounder would move into southern North Carolina from from South Carolina. And there's some interchange down there. There are some fish that are tagged that move around. It's really more interstate down there as far as opposed to maybe a flounder in North Carolina ending up in Florida. I don't know that that's been reported. Maybe it has a stand to be corrected there. But I do think that the genetics data shows that these this is one unit stock. And so the the best approach, the reason that I declared the that first stock assessment unusable for management purposes, because the data was very clear from tagging data and genetic data that managing that assessing this population from North Carolina and not including the rest of the range was not the best science. And so um, we got that stock assessment and what that stock assessment showed was that it was a bad situation um up and down the coast um and it pointed the fingers at where the problems were and you can read that assessment and see for yourself i'm not gonna go into that but the issues are clear where the issues are and what needs to be addressed and uh so i i think the stock assessment that says that the vast majority of the mortality is coming out of certain fisheries and that this is where the problem is and what it needs to be addressed, I think is a reasonable solution. Um, and, and so we'll get into, you know, we could get into a whole other webinar on whether or not the, the parity between managing South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida flounder versus North Carolina. We have a problem in North Carolina. We need to fix the problem in North Carolina. We know the problem. Nothing in the stock assessments has said anything other than bad. So we know we got a problem. We know we need to fix it for everybody's benefit. And so worrying about whether Florida reduces its bag limit when it has only a commercial fishery for the bag limit of fish anyway, is kind of disingenuous in my opinion. Now others think that it's a parity issue. I don't agree, but I'm sure there are a lot of people that, that, that would have disagreed with me on that. But as far as I'm concerned, the data is pretty clear that the stock assessment that included Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina was the best science at the time, and it probably will continue to be. I hope that addresses all of your comments and questions, Billy. Yeah, I guess my my concern with you know having other states in the, the management unit or in the assessment is you you start running into inequities in the data 
collection and methods and you know can they capture the required you know reductions to you know move the needle in the stock assessment i fully agree um north carolina needs to do its part and in in my opinion uh, we go above and beyond in multiple fisheries in part because we are the leader in capturing our recreational effort um, in many species um, while other states still have challenges um, i guess in the the two and ten year you, know, you kind of say what's the ramifications of it i think we see it now or at least i see it and i think that the general public should see it you know under attack management with paybacks the recreational sector is guaranteed to close and we will be closed um for years to come and it's unfortunate i've tried to look at creative ways and i think that what i'm told you know is the statute kind of removes that creativity that actually would be beneficial to the stock and if we need to close we need to close um like you said you could rebuild it back quickly um, but what I'd hate to see is a closure and then just because of the name of the process we can't open it back up but it's a mess and I guess we'll all be a part of it and I'll go down this road and I, I thank you for letting me speak and ask questions and and thank you for your question Bill yeah thank you Billy we're we're starting to push up on an hour um, I don't see anyone with their hand raised right now, but is there any more questions? We probably have time to squeeze in one more real quick, if there is any. Uh, Chuck, I have one uh, more and it, it, it'd be pretty quick. I was just wondering if uh, Wildlife Federation would be open to doing something similar to this with stakeholders at the table, like the commercial fishing industry, the CCA, uh, to kind of get a a wider range of perspective on uh, fisheries issues uh, than, than just what's presented in this type of forum. Thank you. Uh, this is Tim Guestwicky. I'll answer that. I'm the CEO of the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. Uh, thank, thanks for the question, Glenn, and thanks for listening in. Um, you know, we're going to continue this this series and uh, keep putting our information out there, and and would certainly uh value sitting down uh with you guys uh, we'll have to consider you know a, a webinar stakeholder so, you know we want to make sure it was done in a right process so it didn't turn into chaos but I, I think i understand where you're getting at uh let's let just get through this webinar series and see see how things flesh out okay it, it looks like that's that's it we have for today. Lewis or Rocky, do you have any closing comments or anything that you want to wrap this thing up with? Rocky? Yes, uh, I would say that we all still need to be focused on uh, improving our fisheries in North Carolina and taking the necessary steps to improve our fisheries. I, and I would and I would echo that and I but I would also I would also say that if we can use this as a platform to bring stakeholders together and have legitimate bona fide discussions about this, not a thousand people in the Newburn Convention Center, but you know, from my perspective, from a science perspective, from an understanding perspective getting the principal players involved and the principal management decision makers in the room to discuss this. Uh, you know, I hope that that's something that we can that we can move towards after this seminar series is completed. And again, I appreciate everybody coming on. It's good to see Billy. Good to see Glenn. Um, I noticed some other folks on the that I won't call out because they didn't speak, but noticed some other folks on the list that I was I was very pleased to see that they were here and hopefully take information back and you know we'll get some feedback on this. Thank you very much. And thanks for everybody attending and listening in on this. I hope you got something out of it and I'll turn it back over to you, Tara. Yes, I just want to thank you all so much. This was wonderful. I'm sure we all learned a lot. Um, and make sure to tune in to the webinar next week on Thursday at 12 p.m. on the shrimp trawling topic. So that will be another really great one. 
We hope you're all able to join. We'll send a follow-up email with this video in it and with the registration link for the next one. So thank you, Lewis, Rocky, and Chuck, and everyone else for joining, and we hope you have a great day. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you all.